各位先生、各位女士，大家好，欢迎各位来聆听本场讲座。本场讲座的主题名字有点长，叫做“没有游戏设计呢，就写不出行销”两个字。那本讲座的呃主讲者 Nicolas b e l i b e c h e s 他是《Move or Die》的制作人。那他今天要来这边，就是呃，想跟各位开发者分享一个观念，就是可能很多时候开发者都会觉得说，呃，开发和行销是完全分开两件事。但是 Nicolas 他的他的建议就是说，其实你在制作的过程中，你就可以把很多行销的 idea 放进你的游戏设计的思维里面。好，那我们废话不多说，我们就掌声欢迎我们的讲者 Nicolas b e l i b e c h e s 但 yeah， 嗯、um, ，So hi, my name is Nikolai Berbetchev, and I usually start my talks with a joke of how no one can pronounce my name.、Um, and in order to showcase that, I'm just gonna play a short YouTube clip from one of my favorite YouTubers. You don't have to translate this, by the way. <laughs> Come on. Oh no, it's not working. Speaking of Patreon, we also want to thank our patrons. Thank you, Nikolai Berbetchev, Berbici, Berbi. Nikolai, Burbeek, Burbeek. Thank you. Whatever your fucking name is. So yeah,、uh, I'm not sure if you noticed, but I just got braces like a few weeks ago. So if I sound like an idiot, it's because I am one.、Um, I come from Romania, which is kind of far away.、Um, our main export is sadness,、um, and this is Romania, and this is Taipei. <laughs> so I'm sweating a lot. Um, but yeah, I founded a company called Those Awesome Guys, and we're basically a small、uh, team with people from all over the world, and we like to make weird things.、Um, I personally、uh, handle everything except programming.、Uh, that goes to say that I handle the art, animation, even sending marketing emails, trailers, sound design, and a bunch of other things. And I try to look for the Most cheesy photo possible of a developer to represent who I am.、Uh, but yeah, I grew up on Newgrounds. Who here know what Newgrounds is? Nice. For everyone else,、um, Newgrounds is、um, very creative website where creative people go there to basically hang out. It's not as popular as it was before, but it was some sort of a hub for programmers, artists, writers.、Uh, it was a place. Where you would go to play flash games and see flash animations long before YouTube existed.、Um, so it was a super creative hub where I ended up making a bunch of flash games back in the day, and that's also where、um, I ended up making a game called Concern Joe, which was the game that led to my biggest game on Steam called Move or Die. Now, Move or Die is this game that I worked four years on. It's a four-player. Friendship ruining game、um, where your health constantly drains, as the name implies. And this is how it looks. This is how people react to it when they play it.、Um, it came out in 2016, and it was successful based on industry standards.、Um, it sold over half a million units on Steam. It's not a free-to-play game,、um, and. I promised、uh, for those who bought the game that I would keep the game updated for many years to come after it came out. So for around three years, we kept putting out updates that were completely free with no microtransactions because fuck that. Am I allowed to say fuck? <laughs> fuck microtransactions.、Um, so I made these updates. There were super big、uh, content updates with their own trailers and logos and websites.、Um, And during this period, I was making my own trailers for the game and all the marketing on social media and all that. So in this period, I had other developers come to me and be like, "Yo, your trailers are pretty cool. Can you help us with our trailers?" And I realized that I can basically offer this as a service because I. It turns out I'm good at making things look good. 
So I became a publisher, and we published our first game, Monster Prom. Who here knows what Monster Prom is? Nice. Um, Monster Prom is a, um, how do I describe this? A competitive multiplayer dating simulator, which are not words you hear every day. It's kind of a genre mash, and it's super cool. Um, it has really cool uh, art design and writing. It's made by Beautiful Glitch from Spain. And again, we published this game and it was considered successful based on industry standards. It sold over 200,000 units and the developer was very happy. But I had a journey from developer to publisher. And in this journey, I kind of grew up and I noticed uh, behaviors in the developers that I talk to with now, behaviors that I had when I was a developer myself. For example, when I was working on Move or Die, I had this thought of, oh, how, how can I work with a publisher? This is my game, it's my little baby. Who are you to tell me what to do with my game? And that was very naive, and now I learned not to do that. Um, and in my process of becoming a publisher, I've also heard the term, marketing is evil, which is not. Um, and marketing is this super huge elephant that people are kind of ignoring. Like a lot of developers that I've met, even including me back in the day, they want to focus on making the game and they don't focus on talking about the game. And that's very important. That's marketing should take as much time as development. Um, Cause a lot of developers try to do marketing like one or two hours per day, like on the side. And that's gonna result in your game not being successful because no one will know about your game if you don't talk about it. So you should have a dedicated person that is there for marketing. Um, I've also heard the question, when to start marketing? And you're gonna hear a lot of answers to this question. Um, spoiler alert, the answer is now, as soon as possible. Uh, but most people will tell you, oh, you can start marketing mid-development, like as you work on your game. You can do things like you can stream, you can post on social media, you can make trailers for your game, um, or you can do all of that after the game comes out and basically do the same things. However, I have a different opinion. I think that you should start marketing at the game design document level right before you start making your game um, because that's what I'm here to talk about today, uh, that you cannot spell marketing without design. And I figured this out um, that it kind of started back in the day in the arcades. Um, you guys have huge arcades here. We don't have any arcades in Romania and it really bothers me. Uh, but in arcades, sometime back in the day, a programmer figured out that when no one's playing the game, maybe we can showcase the leaderboard on the screen. And that's super clever because what that, that does is it puts a challenge out there for anyone walking in front of that arcade cabinet that basically says, yo, can you do better? Um, and that's super cool because that's marketing at the design level. That was marketing done by a programmer, not by a marketing team. Um, later on, the internet came around and the challenge was no longer restricted to the people in front of the cabinet. It was broadcast broadcasted to everyone in the world. Um, and I figured that I can classify the design marketing kind in three big categories. And the first one is, the sharing kind, the kind that allows you to uh, broadcast your experience. And for example, do you guys know about Zachtronics games? Hands up. Cool, not a lot of you. <laughs> uh, but for those of you who don't know, uh, Zachtronics games are games uh, made by a guy called Zach, obviously, uh, and they're very systematic games. They're games um, designed around building pipelines and making workflows, and they're very mathematical in nature. And at the end of every level in a Zachtronics game, you're presented with this screen. And basically what this screen does is it shows you how well you've done compared to everyone else who played the game. It grades you on cost cycles and area, that vertical thick line, that's where you are, and that graph is what other uh, players did in the game. And that's super clever, because it basically gives you an instant idea of how good you are at the game. However, I wouldn't call this marketing at the design level, because it addresses players that already own and play the game, so it's not really effective. However, there's a button down there that I want to focus on, and that's a record GIF. And that button is super important, because 
I figured you can build a system to record GIFs right in your game. And um, most Zektronics games have this feature. It allows you to basically record a GIF of your pipeline after you're done with it. And other games like Polybridge have the same thing. Um, and even more recently, uh, games added it like My Friend Pedro, which is a lovely game. You should totally try it out. Um, but GIFs is how I was introduced to Fez. It's an old game, but this GIF here was the first interaction I had with the game. I just stumbled upon it on a website, and it's like five seconds long, but it's the perfect length to show you the main mechanic of the game. And that got me instantly interested in the game, and it resulted in me buying the game several times. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen these GIFs all over the internet, and probably that's how you guys were introduced to games like uh, Besieged or Polybridge. What I'm saying is it's super important to allow players to record a GIF uh, in the game because you shouldn't assume that players will do this regardless because no one, well not no one, but not a lot of people have a system in place that always records what's happening and then they know how to edit it into a nice GIF. It should be built in the game. Um, now luckily if you release a game on consoles, you don't really have to worry about that because consoles kind of have a dedicated button for this. But that still didn't stop Blizzard from adding their own button out of, I don't know what. Um, there's also user content to take into consideration. And games like Little Big Planet and like Dreams and most Media Molecule games focus on this. They're games uh, based on the idea of players creating their own content. And you also have it in Super Mario Maker, where you can make your own levels, your own characters. But what about bringing elements from the real world in the game. Um, something like scanning your face and putting it on a character. Sadly, the only example I could find was this ad of Kinect since like 2009 or something, but I'm sure there's examples out there who do this thing. Um, but that's cool, because content created by player is the first step. The next step is modding. And modding is something that I'm a huge fan of because a lot of really cool games that I'm a huge fan of were made by modding. For example, Counter-Strike, and PUBG, and Dota, and Killing Floor, and The Stanley Parable, and Auto Chess, and a bunch of other games. They all started because modding. Uh, and that's also how I started uh, my journey as a game developer through making my own levels in Warcraft 3. So I was very keen on adding a very good modding support in Move or Die. And we ended up with hundreds of characters and levels and voice packs. Um, and the way we did that was we have a folder in our games folders that overwrites any kind of file the game has. And if you put any kind of stupid texture in that mod folder, it overwrites the original game files. And that allows you to basically categorize your mods very cleanly. Um, now I know what you're gonna ask yourself. How will I be sure that players will actually make mods for my game? You make an achievement. And you encourage players to create a mod by giving them an achievement if they publish a mod. And now I know what you're asking. You're asking, oh, but that's gonna lead to so much spam. And the answer is yes, it will. But that's the platform's problem. That's Steam's problem, not my problem. Um, but yeah, this is super cool because um, this is kind of, those are kind of the things I figured would fit into the sharing category. Now, the second category is participating. The kind of marketing that uh, allows you to play with others. Um, in other mediums outside this industry, these are basically referral codes. Um, in this industry, on the storefront level, it's a buy one, get one free kind of deal, uh, like a, fr uh, a four pack, which are not as popular nowadays. But at the design level, at the programming level, it's an achievement that says, play in a game with seven or more players from your friends list. And this is from Team Fortress 2. And a lot of players will want that achievement, so they're gonna bring other players in the game, which is super cool. Um, back in the day when I grew up and I was in high school, not that I'm super old or anything, uh, I had the PSP. And PSPs had this option called ad hoc sharing. Um, and I was playing games like, I think, Naruto. And Naruto had this option that allowed me to send a limited version of the game to another player so we can play one match. And that player, that's all they could do. You don't really see this option anymore. Um, 
I think it's called Friend Pass nowadays, and very few games have it like uh, a way out, or I think Mario Kart does this, I'm not sure. But it's a super cool way to bring more people in your game, allow your game to be played for free for a limited session, um, to basically give other players that initial taste of what your game has to offer. Um, now, the third uh, category is the exciting category. It's a very shitty name, but I couldn't come up with a better one. Um, it's the kind of category that focuses on edgy things or controversial things. So, for example, do you guys know about the whole horse testicles story in Red Dead Redemption? Have you seen that online? Yeah, okay. That's incredibly stupid. However, if you look at the dates of the articles that were posted all over the internet, they go from August to October. That's a long time span. That wasn't like a one-off thing. They heard about it, they wrote about it, and then when the game came out, they had to check if it's actually like that, and there were videos all over. It's so stupid. However, that was the work of like one programmer that it took him, what, one or two hours to implement such a thing in the game, and it was all over the, the news. And that's super interesting, because silly small things like these can get you a lot of popularity. Um, and it doesn't have to be like a stupid thing. It could be the great implementation of a feature, like the ping system in Apex. Again, there were a lot of articles out there pointing out how good this system is, even though it was nothing new. More, a lot of games did this before Apex, but Apex executed upon it really nicely. Um, and I know what you're thinking. Oh, I have to be this AAA game to, to be able to do something like this. You don't have to. Um, on Reddit, there's a subreddit called Hitbox Porn. And the, the purpose of this subreddit is to celebrate games that have great hitboxes. And on this subreddit, you can see GIFs like this, which is super cool, or things like this. So, so it's all about uh, games with great hitboxes, and one developer figured this out, and it's the developer of a game called Blade and Sorcery. This is a game, it's a VR game, that just has good hitboxes, and this developer uh, knew to take advantage of that. And now, if you go on that subreddit, it looks like this, because that developer exploited that little thing, and it's, it has a lot of threads on it, because people love that kind of content. Um, now, back in the day, this whole controversial thing was about blood and gore. Uh, and a lot of games were getting a lot of press because of that. Nowadays, it's not as much. Um, sadly, nowadays, it's about sexual things, like penises and whatnot. And that's super dumb. However, uh, I want to give a shout out to the developers of Genital Jousting, because they managed to take advantage of this thing in a clever way. Um, there were a few examples, uh, a few months ago, games like Hatred or Rape Day, uh, games that were purpose purposefully um, controversial, they were immediately banned and taken down from platforms for good reason. They were mean-spirited games. However, the developers of Genital Jousting managed to get this silly theme this taboo theme, and they managed to add it in a context that made sense. Even though it's a silly game about penises, there was a story there about representation and genders, and it had an interesting journey, and it wasn't just a game going like, ha ha, penises. So I want to give a shout out for them to handle this properly. Um, but there's also other things to keep in mind. Um, there's visual design. There's a lot of games about tanks out there, and I'm not really a tank game kind of guy, but from my perspective, they all kind of look the same. They're all like brown, desaturated, super technical games. Um, but there was one game about tanks that came out a few weeks ago that looked like this, and it instantly got my attention because of the way it looks. Um, because I realized you have basically two options. You can either do what everyone else does and hope that you're gonna get successful by that, and you're gonna make another Battle Royale match three kind of game, or you can just say it, fuck it, and you're gonna do something completely different and be the odd one out, which is very risky, but sometimes it might work, like in the case of Tiny Tanks, which again, it's a lovely game, you should check it out. Um, there was another thing that I noticed uh, right before Move or Day came out. I worked for four years on this game. Um, it wasn't an original idea by any means. It's basically a game about minigames. 
Uh, but a few weeks before it came out, I noticed this game being announced. Now, I won't mention the name of this game, but it came out with this trailer, and it was very similar to Move or Die, down to the mechanics changing uh, idea. And I noticed that it doesn't look that polished. It looks kind of rushed. You can tell that it's a game made in Unity. Um, and I was worried that it would affect the sales of Move or Die, which was not the case, because Move or Die came out, and I think people noticed that the level of polish in Move or Die was higher because I've spent that extra time to make every little detail count. Um, and basically the takeaway from that is that polish should not be something that's ignored. Polish is not something you do at the end of the development cycle. It, it's a pretty high priority thing that can bring more people to your game because of how well it feels. I had a different talk about game feel, but you should, I'm pretty sure you all played a game that felt super cool, but you didn't really know why it felt super cool, like the reloading sound was cool or something like that. It's that one element that when it's there, no one notices, but it feels cool. But when it's not there, everyone notices that something is wrong. Don't ignore polish. Um, so yeah, you can polish your game and, and stand out and you don't have to go like, ha ha, horse balls. Um, but there's also like machinimas. Do you guys know what a machinima is? Cool. Um, for everyone else, machinimas were, not sure, they're not as popular anymore, but back in the day, they were basically tiny videos made in a game. Uh, there were tiny videos made in Halo, for example, where the player would move the characters a little bit and put a voiceover track, and they made it seem like they were talking, and they were creating stories within the game's universe. Um, the kind of things you can do today with Source Filmmaker. Now, that's super important because you want to give players those built-in tools to create those videos or silly GIFs. Um, and there are things like level editors. In Move or Die, I spend a lot of time to make a super user-friendly level editor that allows players to make their own levels, make their own characters, and all that. Uh, and in that level editor, there's a feature called Replay. And in replay mode, you can basically record all your movements, and then you press play, and the game replays every single movement you made. Uh, not only this is cool for players, this is great for making trailers. Because if you want to make a trailer for your game, you want to have control over everything. And especially in a chaotic game like Move or Die, it helped a lot to kind of act out a game mode and then press play and record it. Uh, there's also things like the ability to hide uh, heads-up displays and any kind of interface. Because you don't want that stuff in your trailers. You want a super clean gameplay footage. Uh, and the ability to move the camera around if you have a 3D game. Um, but there's also stupid ideas. Uh, for example, I didn't do this, but I wanted to. Um, in Move or Die, I had this idea where four players would go in a lobby and they would all write a super embarrassing tweet in the game, and they would basically all shake hands and be like, we're in this bet. And then you would play the match, and the loser of the match would automatically tweet out all those embarrassing tweets. <laughs> it's a very stupid idea. I'm glad I didn't do it, but back in my mind, I still kind of want to do it. Because um, it's an interesting way of marketing. Uh, but there's also like Twitch streamers. Um, and there's people playing games, and you watch other people play games, and you go like, oh, that game is cool, I might check it out. However, the chances of you seeing someone play a game and going, oh, that game is cool, I'm gonna check it out, are way lower than uh, actually interacting with the game. And I'm pretty sure you all know this, this was Twitch plays Pokemon, it was so long ago that Twitch was in black and white, but it's a super cool idea to allow your viewers to interact with uh, the game through a stream, and that's exactly what we did in an update that we called Viewers vs. Streamers. And this was an update that focused uh, on Twitch, and every single thing that was written in the chat showed up on the screen. Um, and developers usually do this pretty superficial. They allow viewers to, oh, pick the, new, the next game mode or a mutator. But we wanted to take it a step further and be a little bit more crazy with it. So I did this stupid, stupid thing where there was a game mode where I took the layout of the keyboard, I put it over the screen, and the viewers pressed any button on their keyboard and they would drop a bomb on that screen in that specific point. And that was super fun. The, view, the, the streamer would have to avoid all those bombs. 
and it created this super cool dynamic between the streamer and the viewer. Uh, and it was no longer, oh, I'm watching someone play. It was, oh, I'm part of the experience. And at the end of the stream, you're going to go, hey, that game was pretty cool. I'm going to Google it. Um, so that's super important. Uh, and I'm pretty sure Troy's Chamber was the first game to do this. Uh, and I kind of stole the idea, but don't tell them. Um, and there's also the future. Um, there's things like Google Stadia which basically promises that they're going to lower the time it takes for you to get in a game. For example, if you want to try out a game today, you have to go on the appropriate platform like Steam. You have to look up the game. You have to hope that it has a demo. You have to make sure you can run the demo, download it, run it, play it, and then decide, oh, I like this. I'm going to buy it. Presumably with Google Stadia, you press one button and you're in the middle of the game and you can try it out, which lowers that friction time, which is super cool in theory. And this opens the gates for new marketing possibilities at the design level. For example, maybe Nintendo decides that they want to make um, Mario Maker 3. And for them to make that, they're going to make a super difficult level that they put up on Google Stadia and allow everyone to play, and then whoever finishes that level gets a discount on the game. Or what if a streamer does a similar thing? Uh, what if a streamer makes a super difficult level in a game, puts it out for everyone there, and whoever finishes the level gets some merch from that streamer? <laughs> There's a lot of possibilities uh, that open up with all these new technologies, and that's why you have to keep an open mind for all of these, because I can be here and I can tell you what to do and what not to do in terms of marketing, but if I tell you all of that, it means I already tried those things. And again, you can either do what someone else already did, or you can try to stand out and do your own thing. And for that, you have to be the clever one and try to come up with all these stupid things. Um, but when you look at all of these examples and all of uh, the basically stupid stories I had uh, in the past, you come up with one conclusion, which is a game's success most of the time is based on external factors. However, sometimes a game success is baked right in the design document. Thank you. Now, I think we have time for Q&A. Uh, how does this work? Do people line up behind the microphone or? Okay, if any one of you have any questions, there's a microphone here, come here. Uh, we have quite a bit of time to talk about this. Also, uh, follow me on Twitter and I'm gonna give out Steam keys for Move or Die and Monster Prom for the first handful of people that, that follow me on Twitter. So yeah, questions. Do you have any questions you want to ask? No? No? So we either have the option where we all awkwardly wait here for like half an hour and we just look at each other. <laughs> if not, uh, I'm still around here. I'll be around here if you have any question that you can think of too late. Uh, and you can just come and punch me and I'll gladly talk to you. Um, but yeah, what's the plan? We, the next talk is in, what, 30 minutes? Yeah, you know, it, it, this is the last. Oh, so should, should we wrap up or...? You tell me, you're, you're the moderator. If we don't have any questions. Okay, last chance. Any questions? <laughs> Come on, be the brave one. You can, you can ask things that are completely irrelevant to this talk, like my favorite food, <laughs> which is soup dumpling, something we don't have in Romania. So we, I think we have two questions, one there and then another one all the way there. Uh, hello, Rick and I. Hello. Uh, thanks for the talks, and I'm a big fan of you. I watch every your talk on GDC. Thank you. I'm paying him a lot to lie. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and yeah, uh, in uh, it's not relevant to this talk, but in one of your talk that you say you find like other game developers and or other game you have make a crossover promotion with them, like Rick and Morty or that kind of thing, and. I wonder, uh, like, when you're working with Rick and Morty, and what did you pay them, or how, how did you get to know them, or how did you get to work with them? Okay, so um, a little bit of history. Uh, in Move or Die, we managed to get Rick and Morty. 
How many people here watch Rick and Morty? Yay! Um, so Rick and Morty is this super popular show on Adult Swim, and we managed to get the characters from Rick and Morty in Move or Die. And the way we did that was very weird, because normally you would send an email to someone and then pay a shit ton of money, and then they maybe say yes. Uh, in our case, we went to an event where we showcased our game, um, and contrary to popular belief, going to events does not get you more sales for your game. It brings you super weird opportunities like this one. And we bumped into someone who was working for Adult Swim, uh, the company that broadcasted Rick and Morty. And I've sent them an email. I got drunk with them at a party. And we kind of become friends. And I asked them out of curiosity, hey, can I use Rick and Morty? And they said, maybe. And then it, a long period of silence followed. Uh, and I was put in contact with the creators of Rick and Morty and all that, and the whole process of me saying, hello, can we use Rick and Morty, to actually getting the approval took one year. Um, and we didn't, it was very weird, because they said yes without any contract or without any money. We didn't pay anything to get Rick and Morty in the game, um, because it turns out they were gearing up for their new season release, and they kind of wanted to do some cross promotions with some games that we were not aware of. They just told us that, sure, you can use them as long as they go public on this specific date. And we were like, OK, it's free. So we did that. The season came out. And because of the cross-promotion, we had a huge sales spike um, on our graph because I got drunk with someone at a party. <laughs> so the takeaway is talk to as many people as you can in this industry because everyone is surprisingly friendly and open to discuss about weird things. And who knows who you might get drunk with and end up with these weird opportunities two years down the line. So that's the story of how I got Rick and Morty in, uh, in Move or Die. Um, any other want... questions? There was one back there. Hey, I have any questions. OK, OK, I'll go back. Wait a second. Hi, I'm a huge fan for Move or Die. I'm also and uh, I so remember much. the two years ago that I have a small chat in Facebook with your fan page. And I asked the question that when we will release this game on Switch. So I want to ask you again today. <laughs> because I wait, when, when I played the first time, I think, oh, this is so good. I want to buy it on Switch. <laughs> so I send a message. And you answer me that oh we have this plan, okay. and uh, you oh send, boy. <laughs> yeah, and you send me the, <laughs> the 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 link that asks me to wait, and I wait for two years. So <laughs> I want to ask you again, if you have any plan to release this on Switch. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so first of all, thank you. Uh, second of all, it's complicated. Uh, I made a huge mistake of making our own engine for Move or Die. Because when we started working on the game, uh, back then, Unity didn't have a 2D mode. It was only like Unity 3D. It was in the name of the thing. And we were like, we're making a 2D game. That would be a lot of overhead. So we decided to make our own engine, um, which normally is not a bad decision, depending on what you want to do. But for us, it was a horrible decision because things got out of hand. And we made this kind of little silly engine held together with cardboard and duct tape. And we kept adding more and more things, like, hey, what if we had online multiplayer? What if we had a leveling up system? And it kind of got too big and out of hand. Um, and then the game came out. And we were like, hey, let's put it on consoles. Fuck, this engine doesn't work on other consoles. <laughs> So the process of trying to port your own engine on a new console without any frame of reference turns out it's pretty difficult. Um, so it took us around two years to put it, no, three years to put it on the PS4. And it just came out on the PS4 a few months ago. Uh, and we just realized that, hey, it's pretty hard to sell something that's three years old and go like, hey, guys, this is cool. Buy it. Um, so the answer is. I don't know when the game will come out on the Switch, because I really want to put it on the Switch, because it feels like the kind of game that would be perfect for the Switch, with the two controllers and everything. Um, but it's incredibly def difficult to port that stupid engine <laughs> on, on the Switch. Um, and I learned my mistake. I will never, ever make my engine again. Um, 
but if anyone here is interested in importing an engine to switch, uh, talk to me. I would, I would love to hear that. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? There's one in the back. Can we make sure we have questions in the complete opposites of the room? Just. I can use Chinese to ask. I think you have an open mouth. Can you use Chinese to ask? Can you speak Chinese? I speak fluent English. <laughs> oh, okay, it is fine. I can, I can ask in English. <laughs> <laughs> my, my English is poor, so I'm afraid I will say the wrong sentence or dealing, delivering the wrong meaning. Oh, it's fine? I'll answer anyway. Okay. Uh, in, the, in another session, lad, Yesterday, uh, another uh, okay. Another guy said he he's prefer to make his own engine. Oh, okay, okay. How? I use Chinese. I use Chinese. Okay. So, 昨天有另外一个讲者说，用自己的引擎才能掌控开发的每一个环节。那如果说你下一次又要做一个游戏，那并不是用。哦 ，OK，say something。Yes，Yes，it works now。你好 ，OK，Sorry。So yesterday another guy said that。OK。呃，昨天有另外一位讲者，他说他自己做引擎，他才能掌握游戏的每个细节。那听起来他跟你的意见是相反的，因为。而且就像你刚刚说的，你说 Unity 那时候没有支援你们想要的功能。那如果下次你又要做一个功能，并不是现有引擎支援的，那你还是要用，那你要怎么解决 ？That translation was super smooth. Holy shit! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>、um, woo! Yay for translators!、Um, everyone know the question?、Uh, so yeah. Uh, really quickly,、uh, basically the pros and cons of having your own engine and the control that gives you.、Um, so, well, I'm a bit biased because we ended up making our own engine and we kind of ended up regretting it.、Um, but it heavily depends on the kind of game you're making. I realized in this industry that if you decide to make your own engine and then you spend one day to add a feature that already exists in another engine, you're one day behind your competition. And being on time is incredibly important because I worked on Moverdie for four years, and when it came out in 2016, 30 other games were released in that day on Steam. So it was four years of my life. Going against 30 other games at the same time, and the next day it was 30 more on top. So really, really quickly you get buried down、uh, in this industry, and people will have a harder and harder time finding your game. Especially if you make a mobile game, it's what hundreds of games every day. It's insane. And if Mover Day came out today, I don't think it would have been as popular as it was three years ago.、Uh, but you never know. So I would say. If your game doesn't need anything super special, try to go for an already existing engine because there's pros and cons for both options. But if you have a problem in an already existing engine like Unity, you're、um, assured that hundreds of other developers had that problem and someone already fixed it. Opposed to you have a problem in your own engine and you're on your own.、Um, sure, it gives you a lot of control over everything, and you know exactly where to look when something breaks. But at the same time, it kind of slows down development. So if you make a super crazy game with a super crazy mechanic that is not supported in any engine, and you have to make your own, sure, by all means.、Uh, otherwise, I would say go for an engine that already exists. I'm not sponsored by Unity. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any any other question? There's one behind you. Behind you. It's closer. Well. <laughs> oh, 好吧，有人还是提议要到中间排队，所以大家要来中间排队吗？我们还有很多时间。对。Yeah. 多少多？ Yay! Question. 可以可以用中文，可以用中文。我要用中文。因为因为可以可以翻译。喂，嗯、呃，我想请问，就是你说你之前是
。哦，对不起，就是我想请问，就是你说你之前是做行销，那我想要请请问说，你除了 gift， 然后还有影片之外，还有什么其他的方式去宣传你的游戏吗？那那你就是宣传的部分，就像如果你要抛文的话，你是会有计划性的去去推你的游戏，还是说有？因为我知道有一些人他是一边做，然后一边抛这样子，所以我想要请问你有没有特别的计划，就是去去让你的游戏做曝光 ？OK， so um， everyone knows the question. Um, the the answer to that is um, obviously it depends, like any question in this industry. But there's some cool things you can do. For example, your game can be more or less marketable based on what kind of game it is. For example, if you have, we publish two games. We publish Moverai and Monster Prom. And for Monster Prom, it's a very text-heavy game. That's a lot of text on the screen. And that's a bit more tricky to market. So if you look、uh, in the trailers of Monster Prom, we don't focus on the text, even though that's super funny and super cool. We focus on the art because that sells better. And sadly, we live in the year where people buy games based on how they look. Please don't do that.、Um, but on the other hand, you have Move or Die, which is a four-player friendship-ruining game, and that. Instantly looks much better because when we go to events and we showcase the game, when you play Monster Prom, you go on your own, you put your headphones on, and you sit down for like half an hour and you play the game. But if you look at the Move or Die booth, it's a huge crowd of people yelling and going like, "Ah, holy shit!" And it's way more easy to like observe. So automatically, if I make a tiny GIF of Move or Die, it's more marketable than Monster Prom. So keep that in mind when you design your game.、Um, On the other hand, for social media, you can do a lot of things. A lot of people、uh, keep posting updates, which is cool because it's a very low cost. Like it doesn't, you don't have to invest hundreds of dollars in a marketing campaign. You just talk about what you're doing, and some people are interested in that.、Um, you can also spend a lot of money on trailers and all that.、Uh, in our case, we make them all in house because I love video editing. But I figured. There's no secret sauce. There's no secret key for how to be successful on social media because if there would be one, everyone would use it and no one would be successful anymore.、Um, but I figured the closest thing you can do to be successful on social media is be consistent. If you decide to post updates about your game, do it consistently every week or I don't know twice a week, and that will slowly build a fan base over time because luck. Won't strike overnight. Like if PewDiePie or if someone else plays your game, there won't be like a huge wave of people.、Um, you have to slowly build that over time, and you have to be patient while you do it. So that's why the answer to when to start marketing now. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. I hope I answered. Thank you.、Question. Hello. Hey,、um, first of all, thank thanks for the talk. And have 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 I mentioned that I'm also a big fan of the game? <laughs> Yay! Also, it's so it's so cool to make something and go on a whole different continent and have people say, "Hey, I heard about your game." It's like holy shit! That's so cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay.、Um, I, I I'm very curious about how did you get a connection with Discord?、Um, is there any story behind it? Getting drunk with people.、Um, so, <laughs> again. We went to an event,、um, and I stumbled upon someone who worked at Discord, and they kind of liked our game.、Um, and you have so when we asked for Rick and Morty, a lot of people would be, "No, I don't want to email the guys from Adult Swim. Why would they say yes? I'm a nobody." And that's true. We are all nobodies to them. However, every now and then. They say yes, and you might as well try because a lot of people don't try, don't make that first step of like going to the big guys and asking for stuff.、Um, another thing I did was when I was going to events with a Move or Die booth, I wanted to make like tournaments and basically have people compete in the game, and I wanted to give them something, but I didn't have anything. So I emailed like Corsair and what Kingston and Logitech, and I was like, Hey, I have this game. Give me free stuff. And they said yes, and they sent me free stuff, and it was like, holy shit, that's super cool. So I gave out free stuff to people、um, because, again, you would be surprised how friendly people are. So 
um, we just contacted Discord and they say yes, but I wanted to mention uh, a thing that I didn't, I forgot to mention for Rick and Morty. Uh, one cool thing you can do when you approach these super big guys is basically to tell them, yo, I'm not exactly nobody. Um, so what we did for Rick and Morty is we spent the time to create the characters and have them playable in the game before we contacted Adult Swim. So when we contacted them, we already sent them a video of this is how it's going to look like. Uh, and that basically tells them that, yo, look, you can trust us with your IP. Like, we're not going to fuck it up. Um, so that's cool, because I'm pretty sure that contributed to them saying yes, opposed to just getting a message from a random Romanian dude going like, yeah, I'm a huge fan, let me use Rick and Morty. Um, so yeah, try to be as professional as possible and put in the legwork before you contact them just to prove that you're worth their time. So yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, this is kind of a short question. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> soup dumplings. <laughs> like, all right, so what was the craziest idea that you have thought about, but I mean, in the end, did not get to be implemented in your game? Aside from, if it's the Twitter idea, then what was the second most? Oh God, there's so many. Because basically, so, Move or Die is this wall for ideas. It's a game where you have mini game after mini game. So any kind of stupid idea, I just throw it at Move or Die, prototype it in a few minutes, and see if it works. Um, <laughs> so one thing, I kind of did it, but it didn't turn out well. I wanted to make an app that would give you the mechanic of Move or Die in real life. So you would have an app where it would give you a health bar, and you would physically have to move so you don't die. Uh, so that was like a marketing idea that never really happened because we figured that's pretty hard to make foolproof because what's stopping people from shaking the phone? And then if you use GPS, it would have to go really slow because you have to move a lot before it updates. What if people go on a bus? So yeah, a lot of stupid questions. Um, but yeah, I would say that would be it, like bringing the move or die concept in the real world and see people run around at events. <laughs> Well, cool. thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I was, I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about how you found uh, Monster Prom and decided to, to publish that. Um, so I played it at PAX. PAX is Penny Arcade Expo. It's a huge convention in the US. Um, and the developer was there. Uh, he was showcasing the game, and then I bumped into him. Uh, he saw my GDC talks before, so he knew who I was, and it was a pretty friendly conversation. I think I knew him before that as well. Uh, but I told him that I was uh, going into publishing. And I think the um, biggest selling point I have as a publisher is I'm a small publisher. Um, I hear a lot of developers here uh, say horror stories about them going with a big publisher just because it's like a big name, but they ended up being treated as the side project. Uh, they ended up not getting as much attention from the publisher as they thought they would because that publisher might have more important games. Now us, we're super small. So if we end up publishing you, you get 100% of our attention because we don't have a lineup of 12 other games. Uh, and I feel that's pretty important in today's market where just games get pumped out like that. Uh, and I know publishers hire like trailer making companies to make quick trailers. For us, we can't afford to publish something that's not successful. So we put a lot of effort in making sure that what we put out there is high quality, but also because we're developers at heart. So when we go and we talk to other developers, we basically say, yo, We've been through the shit you're about to go through. So let us help you. So yeah. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks for your talk, and I really enjoyed it. And I have a question is that, because um, you said um, start the marketing now, yeah. but you know sometimes um, when you market your game, like at the very beginning, and after that in the, well, while the developing process, you might change a lot of things. So um, it might be completely different from what you have already marketed. So it might not, uh, like the players, uh, the game you released might not meet the players' expectations. Yeah. So what do you think of it? And 
like, well, you still suggest um, the game developers to market their games in, at the very beginning. Yeah. That's yeah. Um, it very much depends on the developer itself and how ethical you are. Because sadly, you see uh, games that are finished and their marketing is completely different because it's all fake. It's fake screenshots, it's fake trailers. Uh, which is kind of shitty, uh, but it depends on you. Uh, the process of marketing your game from the very beginning, I still think it's cool because the difference might not be that much. And if there's a difference, it's probably, uh, probably a good one because you spent more time and you added more things. So as a player, if I pay for a game because I saw a trailer and then the game ends up being cooler, I won't be mad. Um, so it comes down to you to be the judge of the difference between your marketing material and your game. Because for example, uh, you might work on a game and you know there's gonna be like a cool animation when you die, but it's not implemented yet and you have to put out a trailer tomorrow. I think it's fine to have that animation faked in the trailer knowing that it's gonna be in the end product. So you're, you're the judge on that and I think it's fine. Yeah, um, but like, you know, sometimes because the market is really competitive yeah. and, you know, some sometimes when you develop the game and then in the middle of the development and then the game died, but you already, <laughs> but you already market the game. So it might just, you know, influence maybe the, I don't know, the uh, reputation of your company or your team and whatever. So... I mean, with the specific example of like, the, when you say the game died, you mean development stopped? Yeah, they, they decided not to. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I think it. it doesn't really matter in that case because no one will get to play the game. So they only have the trailers to go off of. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's a, a big problem. Um, it's down to how genuine you are with your marketing. Because even if your game doesn't end up going out there, again, people won't really have a frame of reference. Um, but it's okay to keep it in the realm of what's acceptable. Because we all see in the E3 trailers that look super fancy and then the games come out and they're like, eh, not that fancy. Um, so keep it reasonable, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi, thanks for our talk again. And Hello. I have a question is like, with the game with so many self-advertising -ad features, did this actually lower your spend on advertising or did you just put more money into it just to carry out the momentum? Uh, so wait, say that again. Like if with so many marketing possibilities in the game. Yeah, did it, with the game like so many like GIF sharing or some like social social community like events, or did this lower your spend on the advertising or you put more money oh, into Oh, you mean, you mean if having those tools in yeah. the game ended up with me spending less money on tradition? Um, okay, so um, I would say so. Um, part of it because those kind of tools allow the game to market itself, but also part of it is because I'm a horrible person that doesn't want to spend money. So uh, in the development of Moverlay, we didn't really spend money on marketing. Because when you hear spend money on marketing, people usually talk about traditional marketing, like buying ads and all that. And I'm not a huge fan of buying ads because I don't think they really work. And how many people here click on ads and end up buying it? I mean, eh. Uh, not my thing. So I would rather spend time like my own valuable time and make a cool trailer myself uh, or come up with a stupid idea like whenever we would showcase the game at events, we had um, a little cardboard cutout, like some flyers-ish, with a character outline on them. And it said, draw your own character, post it on social media, and you might get a Steam key. And a lot of people loved that and a lot of people got super creative because it encouraged them to be creative and make super silly characters with markers we had there. And they took photos of those and posted all over social media. And that was a form of self-sustained marketing. We didn't have to collect all of those and take photos of them ourselves. People did them themselves because that's how it was designed to be. So you have to come up with these sort of marketing ideas that work on their own without you pushing them because that takes effort and money. So it depends on you how you want to market your game. Personally, I stay away from the traditional side. We didn't pay any YouTuber or Twitch streamer to play Move or Die, and yet we ended up with like Markiplier and Jacksepticeye playing the game, which have like millions and millions of subscribers. 
just because the game was cool and they kind of liked it. But there's one more thing to mention. We did one thing to convince them to play the game, which was we add their faces in the game as playable characters. And it's very similar to the whole Rick and Morty thing where we added the characters beforehand. I just went on Facebook, found them on Facebook, took the shittiest photo of them I could find, and I just cut them super roughly and put them in the game. They even ha didn't have like proper animations. It was just a stupid head. They went like, doop, 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 doop. And that alone convinced them to play the game because their viewers would love this because of how bad it looks. Um, so that's how we ended up with a lot of huge tier YouTubers and streamers playing the game because we spent that extra, it took me five, 10 minutes to add the character in the game. Um, so yeah, get creative, try to stay away from the traditional marketing because this is not a traditional industry. Get clever, I don't know, it's tricky. <laughs> Thanks, so. Al. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, as, a, as a guy who's named Ben in Eastern Europe, I was curious about what's the game industry in your country like? Did Absent. You... <laughs> 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 I'm like 70% of it. <laughs> so um, how's the gaming industry in uh, Romania? Uh, early in its development. Uh, we don't have a lot of developers in Romania, uh, and that's kind of sad because Romania and a lot of countries within Europe still don't have an option uh, to get education in game development. Like if I wanna be a game developer in Romania, I have no choice in going to a school that would teach me such a thing. Not development, not design, nothing. Um, so every Romanian game developer you meet, they're self-taught out of other people or YouTube tutorials or that's how I grew up. Um, so first of all, it's very difficult. And a lot of, we have a bunch of big companies in Romania. We have Ubisoft, we have EA, Gameloft, King, a bunch of them. Uh, but they don't do a lot of development. They mostly focus on testing and quality assurance because uh, the cost of labor and living in Romania is pretty low. So whenever someone wants to get in the industry, they kind of get sucked up by those big companies, and it's kind of sad. So whoever manages to pull through that and become an indie developer, they're kind of motivated by money. So you end up with a lot of people copying stuff because they look at Flappy Birds, and they were like, Flappy Birds made a bunch of money. I would like a bunch of money. So they ended up copying Flappy Birds. Um, so you don't see a lot of creativity in Romania. There's mostly people doing what others are doing that are successful. So that's what I'm trying to push and that's what I'm trying to motivate people to basically push this medium uh, as far as it can go. Because I think making money in this industry is not that hard. If I want to shit on the money, I just make Move or Die 2. But fuck that. Uh, I want to make new, weirder things. Um, so yeah, the, the industry in Romania is Small, but it's growing. Slow, but it's growing. <laughs> so I hope yeah. I answered your question. I see, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's make this the last question because I'm not sure how much time we have. Sounds good? There's no one giving me a thumbs up, so we'll go with it. Okay, thank you, I'm lucky. Hello. First of all, I'm not a fan of your game, but- Ha ha, I'm yes! <laughs> <laughs> but I have a question here, like uh, I know GIF is very like awesome, and just for example, I have a very cool GIF right now, but actually because like we don't use Twitter that much in Taiwan, so I want to know like when is the best time, like we, like the day or the hour to post that GIF, and you know because worldwide have lots of time zone, and where to post it, and what kind of hashtag should I put, and that's all. Okay. Um, I don't have that information right now in my head. Uh, the people I work with have it, so I strongly recommend you send me an email uh, and I can give you a more in-depth answer, answer after this. Um, the conclusion is you have to spend a little time on the social media that you're about to post on to understand it. Um, something that you might post on, do you guys know Imager? Okay, so Imager is like a, image hosting website, it's all about images. Something you would post there might not necessarily work on Reddit or on Facebook or on 
I don't know, other, nine gag, other places. So try not to come up with like one title and one image and post that everywhere because it's gonna not do as well. You have to analyze a bit what people like on that uh, platform and try to emulate that. Now one cool thing that not a lot of people think of is it's kind of okay to spam. Um, when you see, uh, it's called survivorship bi uh, bias. Uh, the concept of it is when you see a popular GIF of a game out there, you go like, ah, oh, they post this one GIF and they made it. That's not true, that's their 27th GIF or something along those lines. So it's okay to keep trying until one of them hits. Even though it's the exact same GIF with different titles, one of them work, one of them doesn't. It's the internet, it's crazy, no one knows. Um, but yeah, try to repeat what you're doing and observe what works and what doesn't and nudge it in the right direction every time a little bit. Um, and there's a lot of weird hacks that you can do on every platform. I would rather not mention them here, but I can tell them to you in private. Uh, but there's things you can do to like take advantage of the algorithms and whatnot to be, the, be at the front. So yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you everyone for coming here. I'll see you around. <laughs>